Warning, this video and all other videos on this channel are for entertainment purposes only. The content of this video and all other videos on this channel are the opinions of the creator only and do not constitute legal, trading, investment, or financial advice of any kind. Investing carries a high level of risk and the majority of retail clients lose money. Do not invest in capital unless you understand the risk and you are prepared to lose it all. Yeah. Right, come on. One take. All right, hello and welcome to Camel Finance. I'm your boy Camel, and this is your weekend's deep dive TA and all of that good stuff. If you are new here, what we tend to do on a Saturday is take a slightly more macro type of approach. I'm not really a macro guy, to be honest, and I don't think there's any point doing it these days since the data is, let's, let's say, difficult to deal with. But I'm going to present to you the base case hypothesis again, okay? And we're going to look at it and just say, is this thing still in play? Are there some signs that this thing is progressing in our favor? Or are there some signs that this thing is starting to deteriorate and take this base case hypothesis off the table? Today, I also want to talk about a concept in which all market participants essentially fall into one of two categories. So I'm going to present that to you. One category is the liquidity story, printer go burr, they have to print, printing has to prop things up, no more severe recessions, no more severe depressions because they have the printer, they're just going to keep printing money. And then the other camp of people, and I believe this secondary camp to be few and far between, are the deflationary bust crew. And in this camp of people, we have people that think either the printer is not coming this time, and we also have the people that think the printer is coming, but this time around it's not going to work. So I want to talk about that a little bit. As always, I'm going to be looking at the charts, I'm going to show you all of my live positions that are always called out ahead of time. I'm going to show you any positions I'm looking to get into that are new positions in the coming week. And largely, this is just standard camel finance stuff, okay? We're just going to continue to take this one day at a time, continue to do our best to stay on the right side of the trade. And so without further ado, for anyone that hasn't seen it, this was the idea. At the lows, sentiment was too extreme. Everyone was too one-sided. And in fact, we were potentially looking at a blow-off top to new all-time highs, followed by a huge global recession and a deflationary bust. For Bitcoin, the speculation at the time was we would print a new all-time high before the halving and then ultimately a top before November of this year, qualifying it as a left translated four-year cycle in which the implications are we would have to spend the remainder of the four-year cycle in a bear market decline and it would represent the first true secular bear market for Bitcoin, which spans significantly more than the 12 or 13 month average that we are used to seeing. This would be much more like a 24 month plus bear market. Fast forward to today, we are wholly speaking behaving exactly how I would expect to behave. What's very ominous to me about all of this, as I often show, is that we have these three angles. Now, for me personally, I prefer three trend lines that get increasingly steeper because I believe they're harder to cheat than if you have a parabolic curve that you can grab the middle of and just stretch out to fit whatever the bias is. But the speculation has been we have set the first and second angle out of the weekly cycle low and we are now in the not too distant future going to be about to set this third and final blow off top angle. Like I said, there's something ominous about this because whilst we have a blow off top in the making, all of this is framed within the context of a major blow off top that spans all the way back to 2000. So this current, what I believe to be blow off top, this current grand finale move in the stock market just so happens to be occurring right around this neighborhood at the top of a macro parabola. And if we check in on Bitcoin, more or less on track to see this third and final angle come in. I believe we have set the first one in red, the second one as well. I believe we are just about to confirm as we get to the charts at the end, I'll show you where the cycle low is due in something like eight days now or nine days, something like that. Don't quote me. We'll get the real number when we get to the chart section. But any day now, we're probably going to find a cycle low. And if I am right, okay, if this thing does not invalidate, then we will be looking for that third and final angle to come in. Of course, we, as always, are open to seeing invalidation if we get a sideways chop, consolidation for a while, or if we get a technical breakdown and failed cycles, then we can discuss that maybe nothing is different at all besides the all-time high before the halving. Okay, maybe all that we're going to do is something more like this and then standard cycle stuff top around the end of 2025, 12-month bear market as always. But for now, this is an observation. A lot of people think this is a call or a prediction. It's not. This is simply an observation. I am observing that based on the current price action, we are in what looks to be an early parabola. When we have an early parabola as a cycle trader, I am able to observe that this looks far more like a left translated cycle should look than it does if it was going to right translate. So hopefully you can see based on all of this, okay, so far so good in terms of having an expectation and seeing the price match those expectations. Whilst I am calling for much higher prices in both Bitcoin and the stock market in the short to medium term, there is no way in my humble opinion we can indeed pull off a blow off top, okay, that doesn't violate a parabola and break down spectacularly. 
And that is where I believe the pain trade comes in. So if indeed we do start to see acceleration to the upside, this parabola will indeed break down. And it is during all of this downside portion, okay, that we expect to see the pain come in. We expect to see something break, forcing rate cuts, a global recession. And based on the data I'm about to present to you in a moment, I hope you'll be able to see that whilst the recession idea is probably not the most popular idea at the moment, whilst early rate cuts is not the most popular idea, whilst deflation is not a popular idea, because in fact the market seems to think inflation is sticky and we're going to see another round of printing and more of this higher for longer policy amongst a backdrop of sticky and increasing inflation. Based on what I'm about to show you today, hopefully I will be able to at least make you consider that perhaps inflation is not going to continue to be sticky. We are going to see earlier rate cuts. All of this is going to coincide with a parabolic blow off top breaking down across all risk assets and we will likely enter a global recession and a deflationary bust. So it's funny because I wanted to talk about this very idea and then I saw this summary from Henrik and he basically did the work for me. So <laughs> I didn't have to think too hard on this. I just found this and I was like, okay, perfect. Thank you, Henrik. So I'm going to read you this summary, which perfectly describes what I wanted to talk to you about today. There is a great schism, a great divide between what Henrik calls liquidities and the real economy economists. For a bit of context, the liquidities are your people like Raoul Paul that believe everything is all based on liquidity. The Fed can keep printing so we can't ever have a proper crash and a proper recession because they'll just turn the printers on and prop the thing back up. That would be the liquidities side of this argument. And the real economy economists fall into this category of people that actually pay attention to the business cycle, that actually look at things like the consumer, like the unemployment rate, like interest rates, the more traditional macro type of guys. So let's dig into this, okay? The liquidities say that liquidity drives the business cycle. But Henrik here and me say the real economy drives the business cycle. Or to be more precise, high interest rates kills the consumer's ability to consume and hence the economy will roll into a recession. This is in fact a schism, a great divide. Because the question remains, which is actually the driving force here? The real economy, i.e. consumers and housing, or liquidity? Does nothing actually matter anymore because they can print money? If that's what you believe, then perhaps you fall into the liquidities camp. So liquidity may work for some time, right? We've seen it with C19. We get the big plunge, the big crash. Okay, they turn the printers on and everything goes right back, V-shaped recovery, straight back to all-time highs. So we know liquidity may work for some time, but I personally have been making the argument that this is not going to work forever. It's not going to work indefinitely. And in the more short to medium term, I don't think it's going to work this time around either. I have been very much on top of liquidity for this channel. In fact, a catchphrase of this channel around the time of its inception was this is entirely a liquidity driven story. I have made dozens of videos talking about how I think it's liquidity that drives the Bitcoin four year cycle, not the halving. And we've done a very good job of staying on top of liquidity and tracking all of the various forms of stealth QE, such as the BTFP, the reverse repo, the hide the bailout on the FDIC balance sheet instead of on the Fed balance sheet. And in more recent months, Operation Reverse Twist, where we're buying the short end and selling the long end. So we have indeed been on top of liquidity and tracking this thing. And liquidity has indeed been a driving force. As Henrik says here, liquidity may well work for some time at least for as long as you can convince the consumer to take on more debt and consume more by lower interest rates. But what if the consumer got hurt by high inflation and high interest rates? Are they then ready to spend again? Or will they hold back at least just for a little bit? This is where you get the trickle down effect that the liquidities and the Fed take for granted. It does not factor in human psychology, which is, of course, a reality. And so into the financial crisis, did you know liquidity was actually rising? And yet, of course, we still got a recession. The reason for this was because the consumers were struggling with high interest payments, which slowly turned the economy downwards. The real economy determines the up and down in the business cycle, not liquidity. A recession is coming and it will be severe. So here is 2008, okay? Personal interest payments on debt on the bottom. You can see the consumer continues to struggle. This continues to rise. We also have the unemployment rate spiking, of course, spikes in unemployment synonymous with recessions. But all of this, we saw, this is the Fed balance sheet at the top on rising liquidity. Again, liquidities believe that liquidity drives the business cycle up and they can just keep printing and nothing can ever manifest as true deterioration or a true recession because printer go burr, right? So I've said quite a lot. I want to pause here and just ask you, as we progress through the rest of this episode, if you find yourself reacting with emotion to any of this, just be conscious enough to understand and to notice your emotions, okay? The emotions are fine. You can feel them, you can acknowledge them, but just push them to a side 
and try to be as objective as possible because a lot of what I'm about to say goes against the grain, it goes against the narrative. And if you disagree after you've heard it, that is absolutely fine, but it is not okay to hear it and just have some kind of emotional or angry response because what you really wanna hear, what you've been trained to hear is, but print a go burr. Well, they'll just print it. Yeah, well, camel, double pump, okay? I've heard it all before, I hear it all the time, I hear it every day. Just push the need to do that aside. If you believe the printer is coming, that's fine. But try to at least have a look at some of this data as objectively as possible and recognize that even though what I'm about to say is very polarizing, at least I understand, okay? I'm letting you know ahead of time, I recognize it's polarizing. But the very fact that it's polarizing, at least to me, says it is worth considering. So just like in 2008, okay, we started to see unemployment turn up. Now today, and as we do every weekend, I continue to cover the jobless claims, the unemployment, okay? You can see at the hard right edge starting to creep up. As I showed in last Saturday's episode, this is against a backdrop of 19 states in the US triggering the SAM recession rule. And as I also showed last week, okay, we have had the first trigger across the recession trigger dash line in red because of the number of states that have tripped the SAM recession rule. What's really curious about all of this, of course, is that the SAM recession data shown on screen does not include April's data. The SAM recession data lags by one month, it is one month behind, and thus we are this close, okay, with the green and the black, which are no smoothing and three months smoothed. And that doesn't even include April's print, which we already know ahead of time was way, way, way worse than March's. So once this updates next month to include April's data, we are most probably gonna see <laughs> an official recession triggered via the SAM rule. For anyone that doesn't know, the SAM rule signals the start of a recession when the three month moving average of the national unemployment rate raises by half a percentage point or more relative to its low during the previous 12 months. So we are almost certainly going to be there as we include April's print in the next month's readout. And it's gonna be really important to see if we continue to see deterioration in employment once we get May's print released. So again, if I come back here, we are starting to see the unemployment curl up we're starting to see the SAM recession rule triggered as I've shown you already. And small businesses in the US are struggling, okay? Small business optimism has dropped for the third straight month to an 11 year low. Sentiment is even worse than during the 90s and the 2000 dot com bubble. Elevated interest rates and inflation have decreased consumer demand whilst driving up labor costs. These businesses are a major part of the economy accounting for around 44% of US GDP. And they also employ around 62 million people or half the entire American workforce. Small businesses need help. And you can see here, the deterioration is very, very visible. Again, when small businesses start to struggle, of course, they cut their staff numbers. When they cut staff numbers, it continues to drive unemployment higher. Once people have lost their jobs, okay, and they are already struggling from the debt, already struggling to put food on the table from the inflation, already struggling to pay their mortgage back because of the increase in interest rates, losing their job is only gonna make things worse under the hood. And again, I wanna pause here and just say, if you're in the camp of people that think, well, it's fine, printer is coming, okay? Does the printer fix any of these problems that I'm talking about now? Not to mention, we've also got Michigan consumer expectations, consumer sentiment, and current conditions all missing massively as of Friday. So all the while the traders are sat here, comfortable, waiting for that soft landing, waiting for that sweet, sweet printer to drive the price of our assets higher as a function of fiat currency debasement, okay? Tell that to the consumer. Tell that to the average Joe. Deterioration is starting to be clearly visible in my humble opinion. And so we can take ourselves all the way back here and say, if indeed we are going to continue to set this third and final angle, if indeed we are gonna experience a blow off top in risk assets, a big push from the likes of Bitcoin, if indeed we are potentially looking at a blow off top within a monster blow off top, can the printer actually save us from having an extended and drawn out bear market decline? Personally, I'm not convinced. Okay, I'm not convinced when we continue to see deterioration under the hood, when we continue to see people losing their jobs and their houses, I'm not convinced that the printer can actually save us this time around. Not to mention, okay, consumer credit card debt, absolutely wild at the hard right edge. Again, starting to feel eerily similar to back here, especially with the spike in unemployment and the ever increasing liquidity situation. So that is the first polarizing idea dealt with. Do you form in this camp of liquidatists or do you think this deterioration and the stress on the consumer is eventually going to resolve in a big global recession, a big deflationary bust, asset price deflation? 
And speaking of deflation, okay, here's where we start to move into another polarizing idea. That polarizing idea is that CPI, which by the way comes out this Wednesday with the PPI, the Fed's preferred inflation metric, reporting on Tuesday ahead of CPI this time, the polarizing idea is that inflation is in fact not going to be sticky. We are not going to see inflation continue to stick. We are not going to see inflation start to creep back up again as most people think we will. And in fact, I have been speculating for some time that inflation is actually going to continue to slip into disinflation before ultimately ending up in deflation. Disinflation means the CPI number is falling. Deflation means it slips negative. Again, highly polarizing idea. I recognize that it's a highly polarizing idea, but if there's any merit to this at all, then we really should start to see inflation coming off in the next few prints. So eyes on the prize for Tuesday and Wednesday. Of course, the biggest thing I'm looking for is to see if the CME starts to recognize that cuts are coming much sooner than most people expect. Here's another polarizing idea, that higher for longer is BS, okay? <laughs> and the Fed is gonna be forced to cut rates just like it says at the top of this parabolic blow off top in white, do they cut here? Are they forced to cut here because something has broken? As far as the CME is concerned, no chance of seeing cuts in June. Clicking out to July, no chance of seeing cuts in July either, according to the CME. Clicking out to September, you can see it's around a 60-40 split, 60% 60 in favor of cuts for September, and around a 75% probability that we see cuts by November. But of course, if we do start to see PPI and CPI coming off, it is likely that we will get a repricing in some of these interest rates. It's likely that we start to put cuts or more cuts on the table for the year of 2024, as well as shifting the probability that we see them sooner rather than later as well. And there are many reasons why I expect to see this deflation. And in the more short term, a continuation of disinflation. And the reason for that is simple. Here we have the TMC global credit impulse, which leads CPI by about 18 months. As you can see, we are expected to enter a period of deflation in the not too distant future. I've also shown this dozens of times that anything you do to the M2 rate of change, okay, manifests in the US CPI with around an 18 to 19 month lag. Since we have had a down sideways wobble and then down, we are yet to actually see that third and final leg to the downside. I have been speculating that all of this portion is yet to be priced into the CPI curve. And thus I still continue to expect to see more disinflation in the not too distant future, perhaps as early as Tuesday and Wednesday when we get that PPI and CPI data respectively. We had been using Trueflation very successfully to track CPI up until they changed the calculation a few months ago, right before we started to get that sticky round or seemingly sticky round of inflation. But I still think we continue to make lower highs, okay, and perhaps we are about to make a new lower low. It's certainly too early to rule this out. Again, I understand what I'm saying is very polarizing. A lot of people will be saying, how can this guy possibly be calling for more disinflation and even deflation? But to that, I simply say, let's let the data come out. Let's let the price action continue to develop. And just how we can have counter trend moves in price action, we can also have counter trend moves in data. I believe that's all this is, a counter trend wobble before resumption of the primary trend, which of course has been down just as we expect following such a violent snapback of the rate of change of M2. And even if you don't believe that cuts can be coming because inflation is gonna to continue to come off, to that I simply say, tell that to the bond market because the bond market believes that cuts are coming sooner than most people are ready for. The Fed funds rate, the interest rate is in orange and here, and in green is the US two-year bond yield. Every time we've seen the US bond yields roll over, okay, the two-year yield roll over, it has led the onset of a Fed cutting cycle. And you can see that in every other time, okay, two-year yield leads the Fed into cutting rates, two-year yield lower leads the Fed into cutting rates every single time it's ever happened. And if we get a more zoomed in look at the two-year yield, okay, so far working on that breakdown retest before possible resumption to the downside, it hasn't happened yet. But if indeed this does happen to the downside, then again, the bond market is telling us that the Fed is gonna be forced to cut rates sooner rather than later. Remember, if all this occurs against a backdrop of a big blow off top in risk assets, Bitcoin, crypto, the stock market, and all of that is framed within this macro parabola against a backdrop of a significantly deteriorating economy, a consumer that is getting squeezed tighter and tighter every single week, being forced to take on more debt. I don't personally believe there's any other way out of this price action, assuming we get up into this neighborhood, than to resolve spectacularly to the downside. 
I also think that is what the bond market knows. I think this is why we're seeing this deterioration because I think the bond market knows ahead of time what is coming. The Fed is going to be forced to cut those rates and we'll be able to look back at this and say, well, yeah, that was actually quite obvious. That was actually quite obvious that deflation was coming. And one of the fastest ways to get deflation is to have one of these big blow off tops violate to the downside, causing people to flee risk assets and seek short term safety in the dollar. What a wild time to be alive. There are more hints coming out of this market that things aren't quite right under the hood, right? Because amongst the backdrop of having this big blow off top, as I've been showing you, Bitcoin putting in its left translated potentially cycle high. We've also got the dollar breaking out, holding above cycle lows, holding above upward sloping support. Impossible for me to be bearish all the while this is the case. And I believe this is the canary in the coal mine because not only is this occurring against a backdrop of a strong dollar, but it is occurring against a backdrop of gold breaking out to new all-time highs, having confirmed a cycle low this week and it getting a strong push off and a confirmed breakout retest resumption, I think gold resolves significantly higher over the coming couple of weeks. The stock market continues to hunt for its third and final blow off top angle, doesn't it? If I zoom all the way out, you can see first one at the bottom, second one is set. We are now in the not too distant future looking for that third and final angle to come in, that blow off top to start to be set. And again, I submit to you that all of this against a backdrop, okay, of things starting to deteriorate under the hood. We're potentially seeing cuts come in much faster than people are anticipating. For now, at least though, long and strong continue to push all the while we're not invalidated by trading below the upper sloping red support line or trading below the cycle low, then it's only reasonable to remain bullish bias. Since it is a CPI week, okay, probably only reasonable to expect some games to be played. <laughs> probably not as bad as that but it's only reasonable to expect some chop this week until after we've got the data once we've had the data once we've seen it i'm sure we can reveal the true direction which i currently maintain should be up dow jones very similar story looking to see if indeed we can get some games played into tuesday and wednesday perhaps and then continue this rally to the upside and the same deal for the nasdaq okay not a convincing breakout as of yet i think this is probably setting us up for trapping a bunch of bears okay getting the i told you so kang to come back out the melt up deniers before then we reverse after cpi and fire off and if we can do something like that then i think i'm ready to go to full exposure at a nasdaq position and of course if you're a level three member i will notify you in real time and give you the exact level of where i put my stop loss and the entry price etc russell 2k we are still long and strong continuing to push there Here's oil. So I've been talking about shorting oil for a while. Okay, we were waiting for the setup to come to me and it seems to be very close now. I just want to see a little bit more price action because I think this is probably too early to say it's topped on day three and now we're going to see a rollover. I think there's probably a little bit more upside just as a counter trend move, maybe back into resistance. And then you can see I'm getting ready to short this thing. And again, highly unpopular idea, highly polarizing idea, particularly when we were back here, right? And Ultimately, charts don't lie. This thing has not broken out and in fact is looking to break down confirmation via a failed daily cycle. And this thing should be going a lot, lot lower. And of course, if oil is going to roll over, this should drag CPI and inflation in general down with it. Of course, it would also be indicative of waning demand, waning production in the US economy, waning growth. So again, another canary in the coal mine, another domino that is perhaps tilting in our favor. Bitcoin, the cycles remain down, okay, but we are closer than ever now. How many days are we away? Something like around eight days, okay? Eight days until we can find a perfect 60-day cycle low. Out of that cycle low, we expect to come out of here swinging. We expect to set that third and final blow-off top angle, perhaps something like this. Maybe even, because it's Bitcoin, to see a fourth near vertical one come in at some point as well. For now, we've been very patient, okay? We've been knowing and expecting this cycle low should show up around eight days' time. And so it doesn't make any sense to get giddy, get ahead of ourselves, jump in here. I want to be slightly late to the trade in exchange for having a high probability setup that I can be confident will work and will not resolve in a stop loss. So a few more days, let this thing find a swing, a reversal, confirm it with a trend line break, and it should be party time. And of course, out of that cycle low, okay, it should be time to load up on the crypto related stocks. I've had a lot of people ask me to cover these. The reason I haven't been is because we've been covering them in the level three member section. So it's not really fair to those guys. I did think I would use Marathon as a very good example. We have been patiently waiting for a cycle low because I've been speculating that whilst the cycles were down, it was too risky to get long, even though we had a breakout. And you can see so far, okay, we've had a breakout. Lots of people are excited about this, but it's just into this range break in blue. Okay, no sense in having this position right here whilst the cycles remain down. And the reason I wanted to bring up Marathon is we had this big earnings beat for Marathon. Lots of people on Twitter I saw were jumping up and down and giddy. I can't believe how much profit they've made and all of this stuff, right? Marathon's results and earnings look really encouraging. But notice how the price does not react favorably to the good news. 
And the reason is, as I often say, the cycles are in control. Okay, the cycles are in control. Had a cycle low have been due right here, and we then had the news, the market could have said, okay, news was positive, that's why Marathon is flying. But the fact that the cycle low is not due for Bitcoin and thus for Marathon for around eight days tells us that even on good news, it was silly to expect Marathon to perform well because the cycles remain down for another eight days approximately. So once we've had that cycle low, okay, then the market will find a new narrative to append. This is where we'll be looking to go long, probably somewhere down here. And then it should be party time. Bitcoin off to its left translation, Marathon off to some absurd valuation. But I wanted to bring this up. I wanted to show you this one particularly because we had the earnings, right? And it did not perform very well. The same is true of Coinbase. Anyone else notice that Coinbase's earnings came out, okay? Were really, really good. And all the price did since then is roll over. Why? Because the cycles are down. The cycles are in control. It's not yet time to pull the trigger, get to full exposure, and then be looking to sell the entire thing. So again, I suggest to you that the cycles are in control Everything else is narrative that we append based on what we are seeing in the price action. Around eight more days and it should be party time. If it's not, then we know something is wrong under the hood, at least pertaining to my personal base case hypothesis. If we start to get invalidations, as always, we'll address them as they occur. I will present to you the downside scenarios. But if it isn't broke, I do not want to try and fix it. For now, it's a case of long and strong. Let the cycles do what the cycles do. If you are a level three member, look out for the members only video that's coming shortly. Of course, it is nearly time to pull the trigger on those crypto related equities. Let me know which camp of people you fall into. Are you a liquidist or are you a real world economist? If you made it this far, thank you for listening. I know it's probably a very long episode. I know there's probably some polarizing ideas in here. But hopefully if you made it this far, then you did find some value here. In the meantime, I hope you're doing well in life. I hope you have a fantastic weekend. I hope you've got the sun just like I have. Until next time, take care from me. All the best. Cheers. Bye.